Hey, um, welcome to the Joan Didion Juno Diaz room, the J <laughs> JD room here. And as you hear Juno speak, I'm not going to go through all of his awards and accomplishments and publications, but just keep in mind if you hear something and you don't agree with it, that he is a genius. So <laughs> I just want you to that maybe he's right and you're wrong. It's possible, but keep that in mind. It's, it's certified. He's got a little a MacArthur stamp there that says, says so. Hey, um, how you feel? He just flew in from Tokyo yesterday, so I think it's roughly 4.30 a.m. in Tokyo. I'm, I'm, it's something, yeah. <laughs> so, still, it's a pleasure. Welcome. Um, the, you know, the book that really launched you, I think, into the public eye was the, the Oscar Wilde book. That was, and now we're at the 15th anniversary of Oscar is officially 15 years old. Um, now, and I, I wonder, you know, like looking back from this vantage point, uh, how you feel about the impact of this book? No, thank you. I mean, first, Koi, thank you so much for doing this, and folks, everyone, thank you for coming. And uh, you know, one goes to writers' festivals and notes the uh, incredible infrastructure that is required to make these things happen. So, really appreciate the enormous. A largesse that this represents from inside of your community. It's a kind of a extraordinary act of love. Um, not all of us have that, so really grateful um, to be part of that. Um, and I, I think with that, it's an interesting thing as an author, um, especially given how much literature has changed, how much reading has changed, how much literary culture has changed. I write slowly enough where each one of my books uh, was more or less embedded in a different moment in literary culture. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the first book that I wrote was a complete uh, pen and paper mail book. You mailed in your manuscripts, you received your manuscripts by mail. There was no electronic communications whatsoever. Uh, there was none of this building platforms. Uh, you didn't really have to debate too much about whether reading was under the kinds of threat that literacy is under these days. And then by the end of my latest book, um, it's all, everything has been digitized. Literary communities are almost all in the grips of multinational corporations, which better or worse, it just creates a different set of uh, conditions for literacy and for books. Um, bookstores have collapsed in certain ways um, certainly used bookstores, even where I, mm -hmm. I currently am a professor at MIT. I've been there for 20 years. I, I can track the loss of all our bookstores in Cambridge. You know, this is ground zero, um, 30 universities within like 50 miles, and we've lost almost all our bookstores. I think Cambridge is down to two. And when I was there, it started at 11, and that's not counting the small hand-to-hand -hand bookstores. Um, so any book that we're going to discuss longitudinally has to be sort of first contextualized in the, these shifts in literary culture and what it means and how it was received and how it's understood. Um, for me, it was a book that when it first was published, look, nobody gave a damn about it. Typical. It happens. Most of us, 99% of us write books and put our hearts into it and wah, wah. You know, and mine was the kind of thing where I wrote a book and put my heart into it, and somebody in the AP wrote an article about what a disappointing book it was, sales-wise. I was like, wow, not only did the book not do anything, but it was worthy of comment that it didn't do anything. <laughs> and you, got, you got that guy's name? I think it was a towel. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but he's very smart. I mean, I don't nothing personal. I think it's important to think about books in these contexts. And uh, but anyway, then you win a lottery, which is a Pulitzer Prize, and it allows people to put eyes on it, and it allows for the consideration of a book um, that otherwise we don't get. Most of us put a lot into our books. We put a lot into our work. How many of us get a chance for anyone to reflect on it? You know, if you're a parent, you prick your ass and your heart and your kids, and you'll never get a reflection where they're like, wow, well done, for the most part. And I mean, it's true, at least from my context, and uh, I think books are 
and they're not dissimilar. A Pulitzer Prize is just gives you a chance to get an, an X-ray of your book. People will uh, deliberate. Um, and certainly at the time that the book was published, there wasn't a lot of writing from the point of view of, um, of a, a kind of a Dominican nerd. Now, nerds of color are everywhere. You can just put <laughs> nerd and they'll be like, pick a group. Right, pick Garifunas in the Caribbean, and there will be eight or nine communities. Garifuna nerds, but that wasn't the case when I was writing. It hadn't been nerdness hadn't been discovered as a as a commodification category, <laughs> beyond just an identity category, you know. And so it was a it was a, a book that I think for a lot of us nerds certainly opened up a space of conversation. So Oscar, some uh, like a, this main character, somebody you kind of related to as an a nerd? Oh, big thing. time. I mean, yeah. I had that combination where I was a huge nerd in the context of my family. You know, my family, I, I read. Your, but, fam your family, now your family's story is you came to America from the DR, from the Dominican Republic, when you were six. Mm, young, but, right to New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, for me, it's not a joke. I love New Jersey. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> to the, the national mythology uh, against New Jersey, but uh, I love New Jersey. Yeah, and I, I was a big time nerd in, in my new neighborhood and in my, but on the other hand, I wasn't a nerd at all. And I'm not just trying to say this in some exculpatory making excuses for myself. My old man was a boxer. He wanted us to box. I hated boxing, but I did it. Uh, my old man was the military. We, my old man's idea of family time was he would take us to the English Town Rifle Range. Jersey people would know this place, you know? He'd be like, each of you get 100, you know, 100 cartridges. I'm like, okay, great. And so it created this very strange thing happening in my life where on the outside to my other friends, they were like, oh, he's kind of all the, the bells and whistles of ma masculinity. On the other hand, all I wanted to do was turn pages. But your father, I mean, to round out your father, he, he was also a reader. Certainly. That's not, uh, I, I wish I encountered more of that. I think uh -huh. I had to make sure to bring that forward. You know, my father would have books, but my father never spoke about them. He would never be like, here, read a book. What my kind of books? Um, again, this is, we're, we're going to, for certain of us, we know these books. They were what it's called now, and there was a TV show, but they, they were just dreadfuls. They were just short um, popular literature books that in English fell out 30 or 40 years ago, but in Spanish, they're still in circulation, what's called Penny Dreadfuls. Uh, in Spanish, they're in fact still published, hundreds of them. Uh, a lot of the newsstands still in Spanish-speaking places will have these. Little tiny paperbacks, westerns, detectives. My father had a bunch of them in history. He was very interested in history. Did, did reading come easily to you when you came over? Because you're coming from DR, right? And I assume you probably didn't have too much English when you no, got here? No, zero English. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad there was no social media. I would have not learned how to read. There was time, mm -hmm. time to become a reader, time for, you know. I, it's hard to explain it. I have my students, and sometimes they ask me, oh, Grandpa, what was it like in your day? And I'm just like... <laughs> Beyond the obvious bells and whistles that there were just multiple cultures of deliberation and just spaces where people could just think about shit. You so, know? And so for me, I think reading wasn't as hard as it would have been now. I look at my nephews and whew, um, and I found reading easier than speaking English. I found English uh, very, very difficult. I, I couldn't speak it. Uh, accents and you know Americans look generalize about Americans um, they have an almost uh, uh, an allergy to accents hmm. you know combines if anything knits this geographical monstrosity together it's kind of certain xenophobic tendencies and definitely they would hear my accent and it didn't matter if I pronounced the word well or not it would be an issue we're reading nobody can hear your accent you know I I think it's common for us to, readers to try to learn about a writer and then look for the writer's life in the work, you know, uh, where are the parallels, where is the truth. 
Um, is that uh, some, I'm sure you're asked that a lot, Oscar, and even Junior too, where your life plays into these uh, these strong voices in the book. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's different. I mean, you know, I, I always think the best judge of how autobiographical your work is, at least in my context, or like from my experiences, how your family reacts. My, my family, when I published Oscar Wilde, the, 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 the two family members who read it, and it stays two, they happily tell me, you know, it has not evolved. They both said, they're like, who the fuck are these people? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> It's, uh, it feels like fiction. And I think part of it is because we were five siblings, and so we always had this five. It was five siblings, four were a year apart. And when my family thinks of us, they think of this large group, boys and girls. They don't think of these. I tend to write about people who are a lot more solitary, who are a lot more kind of alone. Um, the experience of writing is lonely, so it's not a surprise that the actual practical experience of writing the book ends up infecting the material. I mean, I, I don't think I ever had a, a day by myself for my first 20 years of my life because, you know, five kids, my mom, two bedroom apartment, but I tend to make my, so I would say there's some similarities clearly, but there's not a ton, especially in, yeah. the, in the first book. Yes. My mom was furious when I wrote my first book. She never read it. My sister Gave her the precise, you know? And she was like, I am against it, and I'm against you. So that was, that was more autobiographical. What, what, what was your mother's life like before she came to the U.S.? My mother was, uh, you know, Dominican Republic was a, an interesting place um, for the scholars of this stuff. It's that, um, you know, modernity came late to the Dominican Republic. It wasn't until we received this kind of diabolical dictator that we were more or less sort of grafted into the circuits of new world modernity. The Dominican Republic was incredibly isolated uh, as terms of Latin America compared to some place like Cuba or Puerto Rico, where certainly certain kinds of poverty were endemic, but you know, Cuba had like 30 newspapers, TV channels, radio stations, until the Trujillato, this dictatorship, I think there was barely a radio station. And so my mother comes out of that experience of that transformation from an incredibly agrarian, almost unelectrified society of profound isolation without a ton of access to larger circuits of art, intellectual culture, um, and that transformation where this American-backed dictatorship sort of made these bridges to the larger world. And my mom saw all that. She saw the massive changes um, in land ownership uh, so that she went from being a country girl that didn't know that there was a larger world to having to move to the capital city, suddenly encountering you know, people from all over. I mean, there had been a Japanese post Treaty of San Francisco in 1953, the Japanese community was immigrating through Latin America, Bolivia, Brazil, Peru, common. There'd been a colony in Dominican Republic, so my mom comes from the countryside and moves to the capital right next to Japanese neighbors. And so my mother had this experience of encountering the world in vivo, as we said. And mm. a rural woman, you know, my mom is typical of that. Um, you know, my mom can skin an animal and smoke it. You know, my mom can stitch uh, severe injury. My mom can set a bone. You know, my mom, her she, garden looks insane. She's a country woman. So she, you, your family comes in 74, I think. And Trujillo, his, his, he was assassinated in 61, yep. is that right? So she had a fair amount of her early life under this regime. Did they, is this something they talk, they spoke of in your family, the, the years prior to his assassination or, or what yeah. things they may have seen or experienced? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I think our backgrounds, we have some overlap with this. I mean, yeah. uh, the Trujillo, this dictatorship that I'm discussing was a highly militarized, extremely well-organized kind of proto-fascistic state. Mm -hmm. And which is so odd because you don't expect that in Latin America. 
This is something that would have been much more common in, in a European context. And the level of control on this society, because anyone knows why Americans like building bases on islands, is the same reason why Trujillo found so much success in the Dominican Republic. It is far easy to isolate and control populations on islands. And like the American military that trained Trujillo, Trujillo. And so it was a highly regimented, super spied on society. And they didn't discuss it, they reproduced it. In other words, our family, I was, and my siblings were, have, would have had no problems to a certain degree, one doesn't want to exaggerate, but certainly we would have not had a very large cultural jump had we time traveled back to the Trujillo in 1945. There may have been like technological, da 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 da, but the culture, our family reproduced the culture in the house. I never looked my parents in the eye. I never referred to them by their names. You, if anyone asked you where you were, you never said where you were. You always said a different place, one step over, because all of this survival strategies of the dictatorship. If you were out with your set, let's say us two were out together, they would peep my friends innocently would say, hey, you were out with? I would never say I was out with you because your parents taught you that you didn't implicate anyone in case you got scooped up. And all of these habits I only discovered later because you become an adult and your friends are like, we were out together last night. Why are you saying this? You know, I mean, people would knock on our front door. My house never answered it. If you didn't know people were coming, you never answered that door. Phone would ring, we'd be like this. It was only until we were teenagers and started breaking out, you were desperate to get that phone call. Uh, but yeah, certain habits, you know, reproduce themselves. But again, I'm older. My little brother, you know, who's born in America, he has none of that crap. My little brother thinks we are all batshit, certifiable. See, this kind of, well, you've mentioned somewhere that you, that you saw scars on your mother's back that, uh, do you recall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my mother yeah. was evacuated. She was pregnant 1965 when the Americans, when there was the revolution in the Dominican Republic between pro-dictatorship forces and democratic social socialist forces. And the pro-dictatorship forces were bombing the capital. And my mom was being evacuated and a bomb hit the, the uh, car, the truck that she was in. And so she, you know, she got blown to pieces, but she survived. It didn't, you know, pull her apart away from some people. And so, yeah, she had scars from that. And uh, as a kid, I was like, you know, you would ask your parents. I was of the generation. If you asked your parents a question, you would get like a slap back, you know, so it's, the law of silence. I guess, you know, a lot of immigrants, first generation immigrants are not only disconnected horizontally, like from your place of origin, right, and, and your, your peers, because you're from somewhere else. And you, then you're talking about also being disconnected vertically from the generation above you and, mm -hmm. and probably the generation to follow. Yeah, and my mother was working yeah. all the time, you know. But so I was raised by my grandfather when I was in Domingo, and I think it, that helped a little bit. Because when you're raised by a grandparent, already history is present. You know, you're, even if you're not interested in history, you're just like, this person has lived, even if you don't understand it fully. And I understood it a little bit. Um, I felt that, that if, I un if I was interested in history, which I am, uh, being raised by my grandfather made all the difference. Because he often had to translate a lot of the things he was saying to me into a way that would be historically, or would be, you know, available to a young person, um, you know, and he had stuff that he did, which was just very curious to me when I was young, and I was interested in that as well, and, uh, and that helped. It kept you connected to this culture, but now, how and old were like, you? And I liked older people because of him. How, well, you know, I think we'll be happy to hear that out here, but. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're alive, we all know people who are older than us. And I think it's, it's not always that the culture encourages us to like. You know, the greatest compliment a writer ever paid me was Samuel R. Delaney. He said to me, he's like, you know, he's like all the young writers, they say they like me, but I could tell like 
older people repel them. He's like, you actually like me. And I'm like, hmm. And I always think things like that are my grandfather, you know. How, so how old were you when you first returned to the DR? I was after my 20s. Wow. So you really held off. Or, I mean, did, was your family taking some trips back and you chose not to go? Or? They went once and I was like a teenager. You know, I was like, hey, I'm disaffected. I want some of weed. And they were like, we're going back to DR. I'm like, wait, I get the, I get the apartment all by myself. So I stayed. Huh. Uh, big mistake. And uh, yeah, I didn't do shit. And it wasn't like any, it wasn't like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, which was my dream. My siblings came back tan. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so when did you when did you go? I the first uh, I was in gra first year of graduate school. Um, I had three jobs and I got a, um, a a big paycheck and I was like, oh, I'm going back to the Dominican Republic and I went back. Yeah. And did you feel connected? Oh, or hell no. no? Uh. But I, it felt. I mean, we we chatted a little bit about this, but it kind yeah. of felt normal to me. I, I mean, normal to be disconnected. Well, normal to be like a F minus Dominican. You know, I mean, in the Dominican context of New Jersey, people were like, you read. So that's four grades off. They're like, you're kind of sensitive and weak. They're like, that's another four grades off. Um, you know, oh, do you read a newspaper? You really suck. And so even as a kind of a Jersey Dominican, I was so used to being graded against an unbelievable curve. So when I came home and nothing made sense, it felt normal. And I avoided the dread curse of authenticity. I was so profoundly inauthentic in New Jersey because my friends were all like the types and they were just like, you don't match. That the fact that I was so inauthentic back home, I was like, eh, fuck it. Yeah. My Spanish sucks. Everybody's going to live with it. And I used to joke around with all my cousins. I was like, they would be like, yo, your Spanish is terrible. I'm like, we could speak English if you want. <laughs> but your English is worse than my Spanish, so let's just rock with this. So but nice. it, 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 was, it was a strange world, too, because it's, it's weird when you leave a place when you're young and none of it makes sense when you come back. You're like, yeah. you, no matter how, how I could present it, that certainly being lame Dominican, you know, Jer Jersey prepared me. There was also such a lot of shocks, like, holy cow, how much you miss. I, we were talking last night, and I was sharing with Juno that I came to this country when I was 14, and so I kept alive this myth that I'm a Vietnamese guy have, living in America, and then I didn't go back until I was, then had been here for 25 years. Yeah. And I went back, and you know, the very first minute I was disabused of the notion that I was, that I belong there, because your language and the way you walk and the way you dress and the way you think is completely um, foreign. And so it was really uh, profoundly upsetting to have my myth popped, you know, and and not know kind of where I belonged. And but yeah, I you, kept going you, back. Yeah. I think if you have an appetite, like if you're a teacher, at least if you take teaching seriously, you're kind of used to, you're kind of used to being irrelevant. It's a good way, in a good yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? You got to have a tolerance for irrelevance to do your job right. You know, if you, if you want to be important, probably don't be a teacher, you know? Um, and I kept going back because I didn't mind people just clowning me and being your Spanish sock and... I really actually didn't, because you vote with your feet, right? If that really stung me, I wouldn't have gone back, you know? And I just kept going back, because I was like, oh, this is normal. Well, you, you write about Oscar and you and you're going back and, mm. and, the, and having experiences similar to what you're describing. Yeah, I yeah. usually make them get their feelings hurt than mine were. I know it sounds yeah. crazy, I just, because I knew people, all my friends would tell me I went home and people made fun of my Spanish, and I'm like, if people are talking to you, they're not making fun of your Spanish that much, but whatever. In my mind, I'm thinking, and maybe I'm just saying that to, to soothe my hurt feelings, which is equally possible. I wonder if I could take one of my earlier things and just flip it around. So we were talking about looking for the, the writer in the work, so the life in the work. And we flip it around and say, well, what about the work in the life? You know, so how did writing these things change you? Did it, 
it must have you must have had to have some type of transformation or, or Huge. process. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, to be yeah. a writer. Again, I'm sure there's plenty of them here. There's a tension between life and your art. I mean, it's the oldest one in the world. You've got to like say farewell to big chunks of your life. You know, if you'd like to be out in the world, it's going to really be hard on your work. I mean, it's any of us who have dedicated themselves to a, a practice that takes, you know, you're a doctor, you know. So the isolation of writing you're talking The about. isolation plus, look, your friends are like, let's go to a party. Okay, or you can read the two or three books you need to read to get yourself prepared to be the kind of writer you need to be. Did, did you have to, in other, besides the sacrifices, did you have to change the way you uh, view people or the way, you know, we talk about writer, uh, readers, right? One of the reasons we like to read is we feel somehow it's going to make us more empathetic, that we're going to walk in someone else's shoes for a while. That must be magnified as a writer to write someone else. You really got to walk in their shoes. And does that change how you relate to people or your relationships or? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm always interested in like, again, I was like a big time history kid. And I, I was interested when, you know, after World War II, you could get some really interesting documentations at the Rutgers Library and they would like tally the libraries of Nazis that they would arrest. And you could actually get that, right? You could see the books they read. And, you know, Nazis are a great punching horse, but hey, listen, lots of monstrous people are great readers. And I think that the plenty of writers write sympathetically, but they have very little sympathy. Mm -hmm. And so it's not always a one-to-one. -one. I think one has to be able to be willing to admit that it's... And for me, though, specifically, um, with that understanding that it's not always one-to-one, -one, I realized I almost everything that was... Everything that was my system of of understanding people, I had to kind of revamp to be a writer. You know, I, I just, I think a lot of the judgments that I had, I had to get rid of. I, I was definitely mad at a bunch of people, and I just mean even categories of people. That wasn't useful for me, maybe for other people, that's okay. And so definitely the person who began with the idea of being a writer and the person who succeeded to write books that anybody would read were very, very different. I, my, I just move at a slower pace, just period. I, I let people mean over a longer period of time. I used to be like, oh, you would say one thing. And I was like, well, that, that explains you. And I just, I don't believe that at all anymore. I, I think you have to listen to people for a couple of years before they mean anything. Just, uh, yeah. I and I, th I think the way you wrote Oscar, you know, and you describe him and, and your, your, the kindness and love that you have for this overweight Dominican-American who's lo looking for love, trying to lose his virginity desperately, uh, that, that you have to have some kind of evolution of yeah. your own attitudes to write a character, to write with such kindness yeah. for a character like that. Yeah, you grow up a kid of color, Jersey, 70s, immigrant, accent, poor. You get a yeah. lot of self-loathing. I think if you're, an Amer if you're a person, you grow up with a lot of self-loathing, even if, you're, if you've got the best conditions. Be a woman. Be queer. Have anything, anything that society thinks is wrong with you. Self-loathing seems to come as a default category, and it's hard to be loving towards anyone unless you kind of figure out a way to get rid of some of that stuff. And that's a bit of a challenge. I mean, for me, I always think that when I, when I think of like what, what my writing journey was, it was reading enough books, giving myself enough time, enough space of deliberation, space where I could just think and turn things over, and managing my hatred of self which I think comes, a lot of us have it. And we figure out ways not to think about it, not to deal with it. 
but there's, you know, we're often trained by our families, by our societies to think of things of ourselves as execrable and that maybe we'll make enough money, maybe we'll succeed enough in school. There's these things that we think will cure it. But uh, I kept writing shitty stuff and I couldn't figure it out till I realized, well, maybe it's because, you know, you're the kind of kid that, you know, if I didn't work 60 hours a week. I was like, you're lazy, you're fucking dumb. Your, your first collection, Drown, came out in the mid-90s, and then Oscar Wilde, you know, obviously 10 years, 11 years later, and then How You Lose Her, um, 2012, so you had a span of, of 16 years, something like that, between the publication. Uh, yeah. And, and one so constant well. is this voice of Junior. You know, what, what gives Junior uh, the right to stick around for so long? Why? why why is he the common theme, uh, voice that runs throughout your publications? I, that's a good question. Uh, part of it is that it's an, for me, not for anyone else. Um, it's an for me, it's been a useful instrument to explore the things I like to explore. I find Junior to be, as a character, the way I've kind of uh, sort of organized this persona is somebody who is incredibly observant uh, and highly intellectual and is desperate that nobody knows that and that's sort of very productive. Usually smart people want everybody to know they're smart and I, Junior is so weird because he's usually the smartest person in the room and wants no one to know it. And you can read any of my books and walk away convinced that this kid isn't particularly super smart. Because you know? it's his voice, it's that he's not playing himself up, but you still... And he wants to misdirect you. Yeah. I think it's a voice of misdirection. I've always enjoyed writing about people who don't want you to look where you want to look. They want you to look where they want you to look. And I think that is important as a writer because what really gives literature, and by literature I mean poetry and novels and short story, it's frisson, it's energy, is not what is said. You draw a map of the silences in every book and that is where the power of the book lays. And that's, it's very, very important. What you leave out is what connects and draws people's imagination difference between sort of nonfiction and nonfiction you've got to put everything in you've got to get things in you've got to get things in but human beings attract human beings because our silences resonate as much as our presences resonate what we don't talk about what we leave off the table what you can observe in a person but they don't narrativize all this stuff is fascinating. And as a writer, you got to figure out a way to reproduce it on the page. We do it in person all the time. But to reproduce silences on the page, it takes a different approach. And Junior was a useful way because he is a silence more than he's a presence. Everybody's like, oh, his voice, his voice. But his voice is just an instrument to hide everything he cares about. And it's a lot of stuff that he doesn't say. Uh, I think that... Um really changes the prism that a reader reads through the book. And you had this um, conversation in 2012, I think, um, 10 years ago. And then you're talking with Paula Moya. Mm. Oh, Professor and, Paula and, Moya. And, Stanford, and, brilliant. Uh, and uh, someone that you went to school with a long time ago. or Went to grad school together. And, and you're talking with her about junior and then you say, oh, by the way, he's a, a victim of abuse. And she said, well, wait a second, did I miss this? And you said, well, I didn't really spell it out, but it explains a lot about Junior that he has been abused. And, uh, I think yeah. it's, look, as readers, it's easy to accept what is on offer. As a writer, it's the, the thing that you know most of all. You have to read a book four or five times before you realize that the book isn't what's on offer. The book is what hides behind what's on offer. And um, I just, I had a character who, from his inception, I knew that Junior was a victim of sexual abuse. 
And because I knew that from its inception, Junior would have interests that other guys wouldn't normally have. He's always detailing very closely all of the sexual abuse everywhere in his community. Why is he interested in that? But if you're not paying attention, you wouldn't even notice that he's detailing it obsessively. Why is he interested in that? Well, maybe because something happened to him that makes him interested in it. Where it's so much easier to accept the, this guy who's talking about girls and has like a kind of a voice that's contemporary and sort of like seems to be just only comprised of the kind of toxic, facile, toxic masculinity. Yeah. I enjoy that complexity. It changed. You know, once I read that interview, then I go back and read these. It really changed how I experienced the stories. I wonder, it would probably be the same for a lot of, a lot of readers. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it's funny because like the first two books, I have this book, um, my first book, Drown. There's a, two brothers in it. The bro mm -hmm. two brothers are basically the central characters. The older brother disappears in the book. No explanation. Just disappears. Then this book continues the, the story. And in this book, you realize the brother gets cancer and dies. And then you can't look back at that absence in that first book without realizing, oh, shit, that's what the silence was in the whole book. And I, every book I write, I try to leave a huge silence so that the next book explains it. So Junior is never can say to his beloved partner in Oscar Wilde, I suffered sexual abuse like you. But in a book, hopefully, that I write where it says it, that will also change the brief wondrous life the way that this book changes Drown. This is only interested if you're a grad student type. Mm -hmm. For real. Wow. But as a writer, if you don't play these games with yourself, what's the use? You're alone in a room for three or four fucking years. You got to do something. No, for real. I'm not just saying that. You got to do something. Besides the electric shock machine. Oh my God. <laughs> so, should we be expecting to hear from Junior again? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, I'm trying to. I got to get another book out, but that's hey, been a problem. You know, you, you know, you were talking about the literary culture of the time. This book came out in 2007, and you're talking about the books. And I'm thinking also, you wrote this. I'm thinking about the political time, you know, uh, as a backdrop. And um, so you wrote these during George Bush years, right? And then it comes, and then you, it comes out as a huge success in 2007, 2008. And you're going around doing these book tours while um, Obama and Romney are going around the country duking it out. And then this comes out, and you're huge. <laughs> and we've got this image of. Oh, I, I, I can, it always moves me still, this image of Obama getting out of his car during the first inauguration and taking that walk. It just to, For me, that was such a, uh, regardless of your politics, I think that was such a moment. And, and, and now, and then you're, people are asking you, hey, America is now post-racial. And you kind of pushed back on that a little bit. Uh, yeah. You think about, where we've come culturally since then. What do you what do you think? I mean, I don't think this is I don't think this is sensational to say that we're all Trump's children. Hmm. Which I mean that You're all of some Trump's, people a, ner a little nervous, uncomfortable. I wonder. <laughs> I, everything everything that Trump mobilizes as a person, whether has been readily and greedily adopted by the people who claim to despise or oppose him. I mean, as a society, we're, we're in a very weird place. I think as an artist, you're interested in society because you want to report on it. But certainly, the level of polarization in this society, in our country, can't be laid at the feet of Donald Trump. I opposed him, you know, virulently. But let's not kid ourselves. We're a very strange place. We have never needed more ever, solidarity. And I mean this as a habit of the mind. We've never needed solidarity more. To face the challenges that we all have to face, complicated challenges like climate change, right? Like, oh, that's just one of them. We need solidarity. We need the ability to imagine that people that I don't care about 
can be treated as family. People whose politics I find wild can be treated as family. Solidarity doesn't exist. I mean, that is a habit of the mind. If you're like me on the radical left, people have got a thousand excuses of why anyone to the right of us should never deserve our sympathy, should never deserve. It is something that the entire political spectrum has taken up as an essential component of our lives, which is that if I don't agree with you, and there's always a red line, if I don't agree with you because you said X, you no longer are deserving of solidarity. And what that has done, of course, is that that's basically the memo from what we would call our current economic situation, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is essential mandate is the utter destruction of imaginaries of solidarity. It doesn't care how it does it. Neoliberalism does not want to encounter solidarities. It wants to encounter weak, easily misled individuals. And so it's not surprising that in our political moment, all of us have like hook and just drunk deep from the wine of having always an excuse why we can't be in solidarity with someone. And I understand there's always an alibi. There's always a very good reason why we should not sit next to this person. But I promise you, there's nothing about any of our politics, left or right, that has given any of these corporations a minute loss of sleep. If I was a corporation right now, I would love this moment. This is the happiest moment of my life because solidarity is almost non-existent. You, you could just say two things and stir this country up against each other so quickly. And I just, as a writer, as someone who really believes that we need a future, no matter where we are, I think profoundly, if you don't have habits of solidarity, which require you to be able to tolerate the intolerable, we're fucked. And I mean it, we're fucked. And it's across the political spectrum. Everyone's got an alibi. God told me that you're a problem. God. Well, once you're there, <laughs> there's, no, no, there's no going past it. But we, every side of the spectrum's got their God. God told me, or you're this kind of person. And as a writer, I just, it's a weird place to be right now. Well, you know, I think that common bond of solidarity that, I mean, there is room there for art, right? I mean, I ha always hate to say art should do something, but I would say that art can do something. And I, I'm fascinated how in a very particular specific story of a chubby Dominican American, um, very highly specific and uh, written through your lived experience, how a reader can find some universal truths in there. Uh, so it doesn't seem like just writing about the other or a specific thing fragments us. It actually shows how we are similar. When we are at our best, no question. Yeah. But you know, and, I, and I'm not saying this at a negative, listen, gang, yeah. I believe in us, I believe in literature, but I mean, we do more book banning than reading it seems to me, I always, I'm like, damn, yo. You've got a personal stake in that. Not even. I don't sell enough where if I ban my fucking books, it'd be all right. Like, it's it's honestly, good for sales usually when you get banned, isn't it? No, I mean, I, I, I've got a university gig. If I lived off my writing, I'm not sure I'd have shoes. You know? But look, that's it. We're out of time. But I just think it is profoundly beyond literature. It is profoundly important for all of us to figure out why we've all got very, very good reasons not to practice the one damn muscle that we so desperately need and why this has become so important now. Like, why now? What is it about where we're at as a people what is it about the power of neoliberal moment that has demanded this kind of slavish obedience 
to anti-solidaritist thinking. And it's an important thing to reflect on, but I really appreciate the conversation. Hey, Gino Diaz. Thank you. Thanks very much.